Okay, so I'll be discussing <clears throat> some of the work we've been doing at Facebook uh, for performance improvements of uh, convolutional neural nets, uh, more specifically focusing on the uh, convolutions themselves. Um, <clears throat> so after a brief introduction, I'll describe the, the contributions and some of the new exciting stuff we, we've been doing and conclude with the numbers. <clears throat> So convolutions, I assume everyone's aware uh, of what they are, but just a quick recap. It's a, they, they've been pretty ubiquitous in signal processing, so it's a, it's a method from two functions to, to create a new function that uh, is, is smoother and has uh, nicer properties. It can be viewed, in this case, um, on, as 2D, of 2D convolutions as a sliding window implementation that performs um, pointwise multiplications and sums them up. And the convolutions are, I would say, the computationally expensive portion of the uh, uh, convolutional neural nets. Um, they appear at, at, many, at many layers and they take up 80% plus of the time. They're, they're really the main justification for using GPUs today. Um, and so we've been um, uh, looking at, at, at an approach which would be uh, doing these, these uh, convolutions in, uh, in the Fourier basis. So as a quick reminder, Fourier transform is basically a projection of a, a, a function of a signal onto a um, exponential, uh, complex exponential basis um, um, which has nice orthogonality properties. And the main property, obviously, we're interested in uh, is that in the Fourier domain, the convolutions are actually just pointwise multiplications. So the, um, uh, say the, the com computational cost uh, goes down. So the, the, um, when, uh, in addition, you perform your uh, uh, um, Fourier domain transform using FFT, um, you also have this uh, well-known result that, that basically you get from n squared to n log n. So you, you basically have um, um, lower computa computational cost, and uh, we're going to, to see how we put those to use. So the main contributions of, uh, of this paper is, um, first of all, um, decomposing convolutions as compositions of FFTs, transpose and matrix multiplication kernels that can be written pretty efficiently quite, uh, with, with um, existing vendor libraries. Um, all, these, all these libraries are pretty ubiquitous. We, whatever uh, hardware you buy, you get the, 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 the library for it. Um, they're pretty good on NVIDIA. We added an auto-tuner on top of that. And after doing some initial work, we realized that um, uh, there should be actually opportunities to make a higher performance uh, implementation of both the um, um, Fourier transform, the FFT algorithm, and the matrix multiplication algorithm. So I'll give more detail about those. Um, another one of our contributions is that we made the problem now bandwidth bound. So it's not really bound by uh, flops anymore, but it's really bound by the number of flops of, of, sorry, of bytes you can bring actually into your registers, at least on the GPU, given that the GPU has uh, uh, many, many flops uh, per cycle. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we actually increase the, the, the memory bandwidth, but I would argue that um, not such a bad thing because there are actually algorithm technique from um, high performance computing that actually allow you to move these uh, bandwidth requirements. I, instead of it being from the memory to the register, you can actually reshape your code so that it becomes from cache to register, and there suddenly you, you get a you get a huge kick in the in the bandwidth that's available. Um, <clears throat> so really, what I guess the, 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 the main message here is that we kind of move the ceiling of achievable performance. Like before, it was really the number of flops on the GPU, that's 100% what you can use. Now it's really the bandwidth, and we're working on reducing it further and further. <clears throat> so how do you present convolutions in, uh, in the Fourier domain? So this is a uh, diagram that, that appears in the paper. So basically what happens is you have, uh, let's say, two input uh, tensors on which you apply um, the Fourier transform and you want an output tensor. So here I also color-coded um, the, the different um, uh, data tensors that you're actually using. The blue ones are the input and output of these particular paths uh, that are always here. And the green and red ones are uh, inter uh, intermediate buffers that we, that we add in order to store um, temporary values. 
and the green ones and the red ones basically, the green ones are always necessary, the red ones are necessary only if you do a transposition explicitly, um, which, which we don't always do. And so, um, <clears throat> So basically, we've been uh, working on uh, uh, an implementation. So first implementation that was using the, the NVIDIA library. Um, and that was working pretty well. And we started um, adding some, uh, um, I would say, exploration features, because uh, we, we realized that there's a design space that's actually not easy to um, figure out statically. So um, we added an auto-tuner, which basically looks into um, whether at each step it should look more for batched uh, calls or iterated calls. Iterated calls have a, a certain number of, um, I would say, caveats when you use them in a multi-GPU setting. So there, there's, there's quite a few intricacies there. But basically, we're looking for um, which BLAS call to make, uh, how do you want to interpolate your FFT um, how do, sorry, how do, in, what's the Fourier basis in which you want to uh, uh, perform um, the, the, the FFT depending on the size, whether it's a power two or not, you get different efficiencies. Um, and eventually, um, we also looked at uh, the, the transposition and the, and the matrix multiplication. And we came up also with an alternative that we called FBMM. And there you have a trade-off between efficiency and um, basically additional memory consumption to hold additional uh, buffers. Uh, so we put an auto-tuning on top of that, and we run it basically. Um, and it, it just traverses a search space uh, exhaustively. It's a small search space, so we don't really have a problem there. Um, so that's, that's, that's been enough for our purposes. <clears throat> and then we realized that actually the, the FFT implementation may not be as efficient that we wanted. And really, the reason is that when you get these uh, um, uh, vendor libraries, they're really tuned for many different application sizes. And generally, more for the HPC community. And in the HPC community, you have like very large uh, data sets um, on which you, you must perform, we say, large computations. Um, Convolutional nets actually are a quite different, uh, um, uh, have quite different properties in the sense that you need many, many of those, and you actually can live very well with very small FFTs. And so in practice, what happened um, is that we, we took advantage of that to reduce some inefficiencies in, in, uh, in, the, in the NVIDIA library, and we managed to, to come up with an implementation that also allows you to do zero padding on the fly when you would need to allocate a new buffer if you use the CUDA buffer, if you use, sorry, the, the, the CUDA implementation um, and, and other, uh, uh, other good things that we, that we can do now. <clears throat> so the implementation itself, actually, of FBFFT is described in the paper. But uh, after looking more about it, uh, looking more into it and talking a little bit with NVIDIA, it's already obsolete. So we have something better now. But uh, basically, the idea of the, the paper implementation is that you view uh, the GPU as a wide vector. And you um, basically perform data exchanges, so all communications, using what they call warp shuffle, which is really uh, allowing you to communicate between two processors without going through memory. And we avoided uh, shared memory complete, uh, completely. We only do one round trip to, to global memory. And we end up having a pretty efficient implementation. But actually, it's not that efficient because it's limited by a factor that we didn't take into account, which is not memory bandwidth, which is not compute flops, which is actually the number of these shuffle operations you can do. And it turns out on GPUs, you can do few of those compared to the number of multiplications you can do. So actually, viewing the GPU as a wide vector machine, as many people um, advocate for, is not that good in this respect. Um, such implementation will work actually nicer on a, on a CPU because you actually can do many shuffles uh, uh, per cycle. But anyway, that's, that's life. So we have something up uh, uh, that's, that's nicer coming up. And the memory consumption, so that's, that's traditionally been a problem. And it is a problem. So it's something we need to, to, to be really careful about. Um, so the idea is basically memory consumption is really a trade-off. That, that's a general problem. It's not just FFTs. It's, it's a general problem of trade-off between parallelism, uh, how much uh, work can you do 
in parallel, basically colliding. Uh, uh, you, you don't want memory to be colliding, so you have to write to different locations. So the more you write to different locations, the more parallelism, but the more uh, um, uh, need for uh, uh, memory. And then um, efficiency, uh, depending on the size of what you do, and uh, the, the, the reuse also can be a problem. So all these things have, been, have to be, uh, uh, I would say, uh, balanced against the size of the memory that you, that you want to use. And so, um, as a general rule of thumb, right now we're doing, uh, in the paper version, we're doing 9x uh, uh, memory increase for, one, for the largest layer, and 3x if we only use FBFFT and FBMM. Um, and so there may still be issues for large input sizes, and for that we, we have developed a solution that's based on uh, tiling, which allows you to actually keep, keep things small. So yes, bottom line is memory consumption is a known problem. It's a known problem in the FFT uh, uh, convolutions for uh, neural nets, but it's not a blocking problem. And so the key insight is eventually that whatever you do for convolutional nets, you really only need 15 by, uh, sorry, 16 by 16 or 32 by 32 FFTs. And um, whatever kernel size you use that's below 15 by 15, the, the cost is going to be the same. Either it's a 3 by 3, 5 by 5, 7 by 7. So um, that's, that's an, an, an important point that you don't have to only do 3 by 3. You can do 3 by 3 if you need to, to do it, but you can also consider 7 by 7, 9 by 9, etc. And so eventually the point is to say that really uh, first take care of your algorithm and then start looking at optimizations. Um, and, and yes, we've made the problem main memory uh, bandwidth limited. So I'll be discussing numbers. Uh, I should just mention that this is the implementation as of December 2014. So in these graphs, these are heat maps of um, QFFT plus QBLAS implementation, so not even using our specialized kernels, just the base implementation we did versus uh, the first release of QDNN. And basically, where we're green, we win. The greener we are, uh, the better. And so what you can see is that this, this basically this corner, I would call it, that's a pretty big corner right now. Um, we're working pretty heavily on shifting it towards the corner more and more. But basically for three by three uh, uh, kernels, you can already see that um, there are regimes in which uh, we, we, we can already win. And as we go to five by five, seven by seven, nine by nine, <clears throat> then the corner really becomes a corner. The, the, the top row, I don't think we will ever win there because then you start hitting uh, a regime in which um, you're, um, you're hitting a latency problem and it's not a bandwidth problem anymore. So like the, the, the top row, if you're really doing, you know, fewer than 100 uh, sized batch times input times output planes, then yes, uh, you, you should not use FFTs. But for pretty much all the rest, uh, I think we can be competitive. And um, so this is uh, yeah, even larger sizes. And so um, I come back. So this, this diagrams represent the performance of the, uh, our specialized uh, FFT uh, that we wrote. And this, um, basically the, the the blue circles represent the, uh, the sizes that we're interested in for actual applications. And the big green dot is our current implementation that we're working on. So there's, there's a quest nice, nice jump right there. Uh, we just did it for 32 by 32, but we'll, we'll do it for, for the other ones. And so um, the latest uh, numbers uh, that uh, have been published in the, in, on, the Torch, uh, on the Torch website are basically um, uh, based still, so there's a disclaimer here, they're based still on our December implementation, not on the current stuff we've been doing. Um, these are for Maxwell, which is a different kind of GPU than the Teslas we've been using, so we actually haven't optimized for that. This is quote unquote performance portability, like change GPUs, here's what you get out of the box. So we're doing uh, decently well. We can do better. There are some uh, pretty trivial things that, that we're not doing uh, that, that can improve performance. But basically, we're not, uh, we, we, yes, we have, I would say, the second fastest today. And I think we can get the crown back. Um, and so this is on VGG. So on VGG, there are issues here related to tile, um, sorry, to the input size, which forces you to interpolate in a, in a big Fourier uh, basis, but um, uh, tiling actually helps pretty, pretty, uh, quite a lot in this, uh, in this setting. So 
uh, the latest things that we have is we have updated numbers with uh, this new tiled FFT implementation, implicit padding. We have a bunch of buffer reuse and uh, memory management strategies in order to reuse FFT computed and like effectively cut uh, the, the, the work in half for the FFT portion. We have a quite asynchronous uh, uh, implementation right now to increase the utilization. And um, yes, quite, quite faster FFT is now. Uh, so numbers will only go up. And what's, I think, the main message here is that, yes, we made that stuff uh, bandwidth, uh, memory bandwidth limited. But I think there's also quite some room to still grow. Uh, for instance, using Float 16, we will get, since we're memory bandwidth limited, we will get close to 2x performance on that. So lots of exciting stuff to, to look forward to. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Can you describe the, your current solution for the, this uh, problem, the, the, the shipping in the memory? Oh, so basically what we have is, so the, the, the tiling, um, um, the tiling algorithm, what it does is um, allows you to decompose a big convolution into smaller ones, and each of these small convolutions has a lower footprint. And so eventually what we use is a, uh, a list, of these, uh, list of these buffers that can be either reused if you specify that your um, memory reuse policy should be no reuse, or that can be uh, uh, expanded as much as can fit. And basically, if we detect an out-of-memory error that the, the Memory would be memory cost would be too high. We we revert to a, a a low consumption mode. Basically, that's pretty trivial, but it's it's working really nicely. Any other questions? I guess it's going to be lunchtime. Let's uh, thank the speaker.